In today's video, the divide between rural and mainland life is explored in Elizabeth O'Connor's debut novel, Whalefall. Emma Stone may have turned the role of Bella Baxter into an iconic screen character, but is the book better? Poor Things by Alistair Gray. Terminal Illness is explored in Cherry by Joanne Beard. A book with more misery and just better in every way than A Little Life is Bodies of Light by Jennifer Down. A historical fiction about Mary Queen of Scots in The Tower by Flora Carr. Henry Henry by Alan Bratton is a queer retelling of the Henriad. Speaking of queer retellings, Dayspring by Anthony Oliveira is the story of the Gospels retelled. The impact of corporate greed on an African village in How Beautiful We Were by Imbolo Mabui. Tony Birch's latest novel is about domestic violence in 1960s Melbourne. A Norwegian love story about chronic fatigue and maths in Lean Your Loneliness Slowly Against Mine. The delivery of postcards that are over 35 years old encourages one lady to explore her family's past in kind of, sort of, maybe, but probably not by Imi Nimi. A tale of perfume and partition in The Book of Everlasting Things. The gunpowder plot is crossed with the transatlantic slave trade in Remember, Remember by Al Macaray. And what if you found out that the ancestors of your fiancé owned your ancestors? Dominoes by Phoebe McIntosh. Hello, welcome to Gunpowder Fiction and Plot. My name is Scott. If you're new here, this is a channel where I review books, specifically new release, literary fiction, and global literature. I feel like there's a good bit of historical fiction and a good amount of Aussie literature in the mix today, along with the usual smorgasbord of literature. 14 books. Let's start with the books that didn't work for me and gradually move towards the brilliant and fabulous ones. I have two DNFs to begin with. Dayspring by Anthony Oliveria. I wrote a book. It's about being gay and getting fucked in the butt by God, but like in a God-honoring way, you should read it. And that's what an author needs to say about their forthcoming book for me to pick it up. Unfortunately for this novel, there were just way too many changes of narration, too much jumping around, and I was a little too disorientated to enjoy this. This is definitely a me issue. I'm pretty sensitive to books that don't settle down into a narrative, and I don't give books that jump around too much, very much of a chance. I know that if you're watching this, you probably know if that's a you issue or if that's not a you issue, so you know whether that's something you're just going to disagree with me about and it's not going to be an issue, or maybe you also have this issue and in which case, maybe avoid this one. But this is a queer retelling of the story of Jesus. Easter, the crucifixion, and all of that, but with a bit of a gay love story in there. Henry Henry by Alan Bratton. It's only queer retellings I've DNF this week. I swear I'm not homophobic. Gay authors are excellent. This is a modernised queer retelling of Shakespeare's Henriad or The War of the Roses histories. Now, this is a very personal thing. I hate rich people. I was going to qualify that sentence by adding complaining about money and generally whinging, but I'm not sure there's a need to be very specific. I mean, just to clarify, I do mean proper rich people. The sort of rich people where if they won the lottery, it wouldn't change their financial situation. On top of the whiny rich boy, they're about to go grouse hunting. And that's a plot point in this novel. Something does happen there. But I realise there's no coming back from been rich and hunting. The character in question is not really meant to be overly likeable, but they're also not meant to be overly unlikable. They're meant to be a bit of a mess. And look, the mess part was done very well, but I could just never support Hal in this novel. I pretty much hated him and I wasn't going to be there for his journey. And if you're saying, Scott, that's clearly a bit of an over-the-top reaction, I probably actually agree with you, but it's my reaction and I'm sticking with it. I just don't think it was very fair for me to continue reading this book, either for me or to the book. And just to clarify for the very sensitive people out there, subsistence hunting where you eat what you hunt, I get it. I can't say I like it, but it has its purposes. Hunting as a recreational activity, killing animals for fun, that's worse than kicking a dog. Onto the books I've finished, and I don't have anything left that I don't recommend. Trying to pick a worst book out of these 12 novels is a pretty yuck experience because they're all pretty decent. But nonetheless, it's The Tower by Flora Carr. A historical fiction about Mary Queen of Scots and the women in her entourage. It is set during the time in her life where she was captured and held 
guest, not in the Tower of London as I kind of assumed from the title, but in a castle in Scotland. This is not a story about the falling out she had with her cousin, who was another famous queen who ruled a small and provincial country slightly to the south of Scotland, but the story of how she was separated from her son James and held in Loch Leven Castle. Except rather than being about Mary, and she is definitely the main character, but it's really about the three women around her. Mary's closest friend, Lady Seton, also called Mary, and her maids, Jane and Cuckoo. While the novel is about Mary trying to escape from the castle, it is the relationships that these women have with Mary and with each other that the novel is really about. And there are three things that really come across strongly to me in this novel. The sapphic romance, the way these women were so conscious of Mary and how that might affect them in the future, and the way that men treated the women in this novel. The sexism is really a bit disgusting in this novel. I feel like it was quite well done. I feel like I understood some of the yuckier and more frustrating aspects of being a woman who is quite frequently ogled by men. The isolating experience Mary has where everybody is almost expecting something from her, it made me wonder who genuinely liked her and who didn't, and who were her real friends and how hard it would be friends with somebody. I think the romance, however, was the best bit because I think Flora Carr really crafts these two characters where they don't seem to fit together and as the novel progresses they slowly do and I don't really think that that would have worked if they were a man and a woman. I think that it only works if it's two women and I don't really understand why but I think that's quite exceptional. On the negative side of things, I don't know if this is the strongest novel. The plot and Mary trying to escape was relatively weak. I kind of feel like I'd been dropped in the middle of a much larger novel and it was a little bit slow, but also I kind of feel like the beginning and the ending of this novel was missing. This is much more a historical fiction than it is a literary fiction. You know, for me, for my reading, I definitely prefer those aspects very closely balanced and I feel like this was, you know, not. There was some interesting meat and I still enjoyed the book, but it was more of a light palate cleanser between other books than it was a seriously good novel on its own. Another book that I think is a little bit more historical fiction than it is literary fiction and contains a sapphic romance too is Remember, Remember by Ali McRae. I love the premise of this book. Delphine is an escaped slave in 1770s London where the laws around slavery and the actions taken by the society are somewhat different. Vincent, her brother, hasn't escaped and she must find a way to help him. This very quickly morphs into Delphine taking inspiration from Guy Fawkes and the gunpowder plot to blow up Parliament and try and bring down the slave trade. Now if you know anything about the gunpowder plot you probably realise that my channel name is paying a little bit of homage to it. It is an event that I find quite interesting and it asks a question I'm a little bit obsessed with. When is violence against the state necessary? Is it ever justified? And these are themes that are central to Al Macrae's story too. Along with the question, should we work within the system to change it or outside of the system to change it? These are really wonderful conversation starters. And as a result, I think this is a fantastic book club novel. Macrae is also looking into slavery and people acting outside of the law without fear of punishment. If you know your history, you know when slavery was no longer legal, that the owners of slaves were paid a compensation for them. The debt was so large that the UK only finished paying it off in the last decade. Guy Fawkes and his Catholic rebels, their causes and what they were fighting against in their persecution, they're a little bit harder for us to understand in our modern society, but I think racism and slavery are very easy for us to understand. I think that's a statement that is both complimentary and critical to our world today as well. The choice to transform Fawkes into a young, queer, escaped Caribbean slave, fighting against against a system that has abused her and that is currently abusing her brother makes the dilemma so much more understandable to the reader, so much more easy to support. Would you blow up the parliament of a country that 
has enslaved you and your family. I think this novel is kind of marketed a little bit poorly. I get it. I've made the same simplification or error when I'm reviewing it. The gunpowder plot is only the inspiration for Delphine's actions, but this novel is not a retelling. It represents dissatisfaction, violent protest, and rebellion, and all that is relevant to this novel, but this is a novel about slavery and the fight to abolish it. It is much more a Walter Scott Prize novel than it is a Booker Prize novel. It's exciting, it's exhilarating, it has an excellently strong plot, it is an excellently formed commercial adventure novel. This is a category of books that I really do also enjoy, but it's not my preferred category. And maybe my opinion of it is reflecting my personal tastes rather than the quality of this novel. Lean Your Loneliness, Slowly Against Mine by Clara Havberg, translated from Norwegian by Alison McCulloch. Raquel is a brilliant math student who meets her lecturer, Jacob. The two share a love for literature and become very flirty friends, something that is complicated by Jacob having a wife and being in a position of power. Jacob compares Raquel to a Sofia Kovalezhiga, a real person who lived in the second half of the 19th century. She was a famous mathematician and the first woman to obtain a doctorate in mathematics. She was the creator of the Cauchy Kovalesha theorem, which expanded on the works of Augustine Cauchy. And as somebody with an undergraduate degree in science majoring in maths, it's some pretty badass shit that I really struggle to understand myself, let alone explain. But it's to do with partial differential equations. And all you really need to know is that she's impressive and that Jacob is writing a novel about her. I found it quite interesting that the three characters central to this novel are all mathematicians with a love for literature. This is not the most common of traits I associate with mathematicians. Our author, Clara Halvberg, is also a mathematician who clearly loves literature as well. STEM is so male-dominated, and like in my third year physics, we had 27 men and two women, and both the women were exchange students too, so by third year we managed to kick out all the women. And while that was longer ago than I care to admit, I think it's so important to show brilliant women in these sectors so that women aren't discouraged. Not that this is the point of the book, but it is nice that it did it. While this book is about a pretty toxic relationship, it is also about a chronic illness that Raquel gets. While the illness is never defined, it does very much read like chronic fatigue syndrome. And while I'm mentioning conditions that are not mentioned in the book but are clearly there, Raquel is quite clearly neurodiverse, almost certainly somewhere on the autism spectrum. She takes statements too literally, misunderstands them. She's completely brilliant and startlingly naive. She sees everything in black and white terms, and she doesn't understand how she could be as brilliant as Jacob. She is just a student at the beginning of the novel, after all. This book does one thing excellently and one thing poorly. The depiction of chronic fatigue, of only having so many spoons, of dividing your resources, of the system that seems to be so ideally constructed to prevent somebody with chronic fatigue from getting help, the societal lack of understanding around those abilities, the bureaucratic assessment around the ability to work and the eligibility for welfare payments. I was so angry at the system and how it treated Raquel in this novel. On the other hand, the toxic relationship between Jacob and Raquel didn't translate for me. The exact nature of it, I mean, it's clearly very one-sided, and as a reader, you understand that. But Raquel doesn't, and it's very clear that Jacob is never going to leave his wife. Only an idiot would think otherwise. And I know it's much harder to apply that logic when you're emotionally invested in the situation. But I think it's up to the author to show you why a character believes something that isn't intuitive to the reader. And I really did struggle with that. The novel compares itself to fractals, which is a mathematical shape that is continually repeating as you zoom in. This is meant to capture the author's own experience, writing with chronic fatigue herself, only being able to write a sentence some days, then having to put it all together. While that may have made some sense to the author, I didn't really feel like it came through reading it. It just felt like a slightly episodic novel. 
and I guess a lot of novels are that. There are a few issues with this novel where you're wondering, is this the book or is this the translation? Is there something weird about Norwegian and English that means some things are untranslatable and I'm missing something? I often wonder this when I'm reading translated books in general, especially when a book manages to both impress and disappoint me. This was my Patreon book club pick and I'm running two video chats to help deal with multiple time zones and because they're popular. And while a bit of a mixed novel, it was really interesting to have a chat with my Patreons about this. And what I found really interesting was the complete different directions the two conversations went in. Reading a book is so often an experience between you and the book, and nobody's experience of reading is going to be the same because nobody's experiences are the same. But I feel like this is a book that really exaggerated that. I also think this is a great time in the video to thank my wonderful Patreons for their support and for their thoughts and insights into this book and all the books that we read together. If you would like to support this channel, help me make more videos and chat books with me from time to time, the link is in the description. Why not join up? Kind of, sort of, maybe, but probably not by Imbi Nimi. Phoebe Cotton cannot stand the sound of other people eating crunching crisps, chewing gum, slurping soup. She feels not quite right. She feels like an outsider because of her condition, embarrassed by it. She struggles to make friends and form relationships because of the lack of confidence it leaves her with. One day Phoebe gets a series of unusual postcards in the mail. The postcards are addressed to somebody no longer living at her house and were sent when the Berlin Wall was still standing. But Phoebe has inherited the house from her grandmother who has lived at 6 Salmon Street before the wall was even built and nobody by the name addressed on the card has ever lived there. The mystery takes Phoebe to a local post office where she meets Monty, an interaction that leads to a very cute romance between two people without a lot of confidence. Susie is a university student, broke and desperate for the attention of Jay, her kind of boyfriend. Jay seems to be more interested in Kai, and I don't mean sexually, I mean he idolises Kai. Kai is exactly who you think of when you say privileged art wanker with an inflated sense of self-importance and ego. In an op shop suitcase, Susie discovers a collection of postcards, only for Jay and Kai to steal them from her and run an anti-art project. The gradual posting of all of the postcards. This leads to Sue's meeting Phoebe and Monty, and the three of them start to investigate who wrote the letters and who the original recipient was intended to be. What I really enjoy is when you get this very like genre fiction style plot, and in this case, it all leads to this mystery. But throughout it, there's all this identity and confidence issues attached to everything. It's actually quite a literary novel with a very genre framework. And this is a book that grabs pieces from mystery, romance, contemporary, literary fiction and blends them together into something new. And I always adore novels that do that. All three of these characters are seeking to fit in, in different ways, and are struggling, some more than others. It is a novel about friendship and acceptance and a hidden past. It's about learning to love yourself and who you are before you can love others. It's a really feel-good, cosy read, but it's still very emotionally connective. Poor Things by Alistair Gray. Nell recently put on the Emma Stone movie that this book is based on, and I confessed, while I didn't watch the entire movie, I did get quite sucked into it. Movies are not really my thing. I just don't like enough of them to figure out which ones are going to work for me. But this one was pretty awesome, and it made me want to pick up the novel. While the book was actually quite good, I'm going to give you advice I will simply never give. Watch the movie instead. This is very much a twisted Frankenstein sort of novel. Godwin Baxter is a fantastic scientist who can do things that nobody else can. His latest creation is Bella, a companion he built for himself. After acquiring a body of a pregnant woman drowned, he decides to place the brain of the unborn child into the woman and bring her back to life that way, reasoning that it would be against the wishes of the mother to bring her back to life 
After all, she was a suicide victim. Bella is impulsive, developing at an incredible rate, so her brain can essentially catch up to her body. She is horny as fuck, and despite her clear mental shortcomings, is the object of at least four men and one woman's desires. Although, to be fair to those people, only two of them know what she is. This is a really feminist novel, and Grey is really looking at the desires of men and the independence of women and pitting these forces against each other. One of the things I found fascinating reading a feminist novel written by a man in the early 90s is trying to determine what was satire and what was Grey calling out a patriarchal society and what was a dated view from 30 years ago? What was Grey not getting it? And what that does is it causes us to ponder on these issues more, which is indeed the point of the novel in the first place, which I guess tells you that whether or not Grey was a good feminist, he was certainly a good author. He definitely leads things intentionally unclear, so you have to think about them a bit. Grey uses that technique in other places too. He includes a confusing level of unreliable narrator, having different accounts of the event told by different characters, which more than contradict each other, but flat out challenge the events you've just read. This is a gothic, literary, speculative, historical fiction, fantasy, science fiction, feminist, Scottish, black comedy. And if that doesn't scream that it's going to be a little bit bizarre to you, then you really need to read more books. But there is a reason why I think the movie is better. With all of those genres listed above, it can be a little bit confusing as a reader. But the movie itself does lean into the black comedy of it all. It keeps the other elements, but it is a comedy first. And some of the best lines from the movie... I must go punch that baby. ...are not found in the book. The movie has a clear vision for what it wants to be. And the book lacks that. It's still fun, engaging and thought-provoking. But it's not as funny and it's not as well centred. Sherry by Joanne Beard. This is the novel Gemma recommended I read for Misery May, and it definitely delivers on that. A novella about a woman, Sherry, who has a terminal illness. It details the last year of her life with a particular focus on the final few days. Her desire to pick the time she dies and the complications with that. This is not really a big theme read. I mean, obviously, euthanasia and assisted dying and terminal illness and the complexities around that are big themes, but this is much more a big emotions read. You know where this book is going. The characters are well-formed, the prose is lovely, and the novel is devastating. I don't really feel like I have a lot to say about this. It's like 60 or 70 pages, and it does exactly what you expect this book to do. If you like this, I really recommend Mayflies by Andrew O'Hagan, which is basically this book, but in Scotland includes the theme of male friendship as well. The Book of Everlasting Things by Anachal Malhotra. This was another Patreon book club read here, and this is a novel about partition set in Lahore and also involving World War One. Now, if you don't know, Lahore is very close to the border between Pakistan and India, but it is a major city in Pakistan now. And the border cities had a large population of both Hindu and Muslims on both sides of the border. This is a novel about Samir, a Hindu man, and Firdras, a Muslim woman, who fall in love before Petition. And both are very young when Petition happens, and they're separated. Samir goes to India, but before long ends up in France, while Firdras stays in Lahore. Samir is a perfumer, and if you're even remotely interested in perfume, pick up this book. Samir's uncle was also a perfumer and he went away to war. Communication sort of dropped off and he's assumed dead, but years later he returns, never speaking of what happened or his time in France. Unable to make contact with Ferdris, Samir looks for clues as to what happened to his uncle and also into making the perfect perfume, a perfume he calls Ferdris, the scent of the woman he loves. This is a very tragic and sad love story told across time and space 
the relationship between Samir and Firdras is a representation of the relationship between Pakistan and India. And I think it's summed up by Samir's obsession over smells and perfumes, only for us readers to later discover that Firdras has no sense of smell. Whale Fall by Elizabeth O'Connor. Before I talk about this book, I just want to mention the first line of the blurb. A stunning debut from an award-winning writer. It just feels like a contradictory statement. It's not because she's written several short stories that I assume have clearly won awards, but it did amuse me. Set in 1938 on a remote Welsh island, this very much reminds me of Clear by Karis Davis, which I reviewed in my last Recent Reads video. And if you're only going to read one of these two books, then this is the one I recommend. Two English ethnographers arrive on the island to study the culture, and they ask Mandog, a young lady who has never left the island, to work for them. The novel itself is told from Madog's point of view. Madog is drawn to the couple at the possibilities they represent. But she's also wary of the encroachment on the society, on the traditional way of life, which they represent. One of the things I really like is that O'Connor picks 1938 as the time to set this novel. Neville Chamberlain is about to declare war on Hitler, and it all feels so far away, so unimportant to the lives of these people. It's such a wonderful way to demonstrate the remoteness of this island is such a wonderful way to represent how culturally different it is to London. And you can almost speculate that what if hypothetically Hitler won the war and took over the UK? Would the lives of the people on this tiny Welsh island be changed? The ethnographers are clearly a representation of mainland society, and while they're literally there to detail the lives of the people on the island, you start to realise how they're not doing that job terribly well. In fact, they're actively upsetting the culture. While these islanders live off Fitch, they're terrified of the water. They don't learn to swim. They view the water as death, which is another way of demonstrating the isolation they have from the mainland. They have to cross death in order to go to the mainland. But the ethnographers ask a fisherman to do his job in the sea so that they can get a photo, capturing a completely inaccurate scene while unknowingly risking his life. The disrespect the mainlanders have for the islanders is from a place of ignorance too. You can see lessons of racism in this. One conversation they have with Madog is, you're part of Britain, you can just come to London if you want, completely ignoring the lack of support she would have going into the complete unknown. The assumption that it must be done their way. Or not even that assumption, the assumption that their way is the only possible way. There is something so universal about the assumptions of the dominant culture that the minorities will just conform and catch up. That the dominant way of life must be the desirable way of life. This is quite a short novel. It is very simple, but it's very well done. It has lovely prose, and I, I've said that about a few novels, but this, this has the nicest prose of any of the novels I'm going to talk about today. It has well-crafted characters. Maybe it's slightly heavy-handed with the themes and the plot is a little bit simplistic, but I don't think either of those things are flaws. They're more bookish preferences. How Beautiful We Were by Imbolo Mabue. I kind of feel like the last person in the bookish world to get to this book, but sometimes books are not available in certain places and at certain times, they become successful. And I really enjoy reading African literature and I try to always make sure I catch up on the big ones. This is a novel about the inhabitants of a fictional African village that has had oil or something like that discovered under it and the mining company that comes in. And this is essentially detailing incredibly well the power struggles between the villagers and the mining company. Things like the children getting sick and dying from drinking the water because of a pipeline leak. One of the things I don't think a lot of people realise is that the country that you live in, and I, and I don't really care where you're watching this video from at the moment, that country is controlled by violence or the threat of violence. Any legal system carries violence or the threat of violence as the controlling factor. But Mambui very clearly understands this and really effectively demonstrates it. She demonstrates how democracy can be 
purchased by big companies. These communities fight against them. There's quite a few characters in this community and the tactics they use to fight this are varied from gaining education on taking legal action to acts of guerrilla violence. One of my favorite demonstrations of the pointlessness of the resistance is that as they're preparing a court case, the locals are asked, what do they want? And they say for the mining company to leave and to put the land back the way it was before. And the response is, well, you can't get that, but you can get money. And the system doesn't recognize anything but finances. It doesn't recognize the use of money or the limitations of money. Mabui places this in an unnamed African country. And for me, it brings up images of Sierra Leone or the Democratic Republic of Congo. But there are countless African villages in countless countries that have been legally pillaged by oil and mining companies. And I'm not sure it needs to be a specifically African country either. Think of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Or in 2020, Rio Tinto blew up a sacred indigenous site in Western Australia. Terrorist acts by multinational companies with billions of dollars of backing and connections to the absolute scum of our society. Sorry, I mean to the governments that run our society are commonplace. This is not just an African problem. Corruption might not be as common in Western governments as in African governments, but that's only because we've found a way to systemize and legalize it. And it's all something that Mabui is calling out exposing, showing the power dynamics and the mechanism of. This is a wonderful book. I could probably be critical of it too. I mean, I haven't mentioned a single character in my review of it yet, and there are some very strong characters, but Mabue is more concerned about the society as a whole than the individuals. And you could argue that individuality is very much an intentional thing, and maybe that this is another layer that Mabue is trying to include. I'm not sure. It's not like the character building is bad or the character construction is poor. It's just that it feels kind of unimportant. Just a great example of why everybody should be an anti-capitalist. Three books left and I'm going to discuss my favourite book early because it's a reread and if you're a long-term viewer of this channel you might know I've posted a dedicated review of this book and raved about it in my best books of 2022 and other such videos and that this is the Misery May group read Bodies of Light by Jennifer Down. This is a more tragic novel than A Little Life and a significantly better written one. You could call this misery porn I'm not going to argue with it but it does have its points it is doing something. This book is inspired by the case of Kathleen Folbig. In 2003, she was found guilty of murdering her four infant children. 20 years later, December of last year actually, well after this book was published, reanalysis of the evidence found her innocent. It found that her children had died of natural causes and she was released from prison. The story of Kathleen Folbig is really tragic and horrible and Downs has changed huge parts of it, cutting out tragic events and adding in others. This is after all an inspiration, not a retelling. Downs is exploring the failure of institutions in this novel. Maggie is in foster care, an orphanage, school, university, an asylum, hospital, She's married. She has to deal with the police. And I think it's fair to say that all of those institutions fail her at one point or another in this novel. And I'm actually leaving out quite a few others because I do want to keep some surprises for you for later in the novel. And none of these institutions fail her in quite the same way, but yet they all fail to put the patient first. Some of them put the process first, some of them just don't consider Maggie at all, and some of them seek to take advantage of her. This is very much a cradle to grave story of Maggie, and there are four relationships of note in this novel. None of these relationships are perfect, although one is significantly worse than the others. But the problem with these relationships, the problems Maggie sees, all come from her past, her trauma, the lack of care that was provided for her. And Downs is demonstrating how one failure can become multiple failures, how bad luck can strike you down and it can just fuck you up for the rest of your life. Downs really captures the voice of a lower socioeconomic white Australia. Even the parts of this novel in America have an Aussiness to them. I often find Aussie authors tend to exaggerate in a very dated way. G'day mate, Struth, stone the crows. I've only ever heard those things said in parody, by the way. 
Well, Downs has set this novel in a time and place that actually is my childhood. Maggie gets a job where I buy my groceries from, and the language it fits in. I can't help but be impressed that an author so young as to be a baby or not even born for large parts of when this novel was set captured a time period they were not alive for so accurately. This novel won the Miles Franklin Award for the Best Aussie Novel in 2022, and it beat some incredible books in the process. Trust me, 2022 was a very strong year, and I think that it was well worth the win. I've been very brief with my review of this amazing novel here. I will link my standalone review in the descriptions if you want to have a little bit more detail. But this is a must-read if you like miserable books. Dominoes by Phoebe McIntosh. Layla is a mixed race woman. She has a black Jamaican mother and a father she has never met but who was white. She is quite light skinned and if you look at Phoebe McIntosh you can probably guess that she's based Layla's appearance on her own. In 29 days Layla is about to marry Andy, a wealthy man of Scottish ancestry. And the kicker is, they both have the same last name, McKinnon. So there's going to be none of those last name issues or arguments. Layla's best friend, Sierra, doesn't take to Andy. Sierra, previously unquestionably Layla's bridesmaid, is now only questionably attending the wedding. This leads to a lot of issues being brought up. Obviously, I don't think interracial relationships are a bad thing, but the idea of marrying into a white family diluting the blackness of somebody. And when you combine that with colorism and the fact that Layla is very white or very light skinned herself, it creates all these emotions around like, are you turning your back on being black? For Sierra, that's not an option for her. She's too dark to pass. Layla is also the subject of all sorts of microaggressions from Andy's family, the majority of which stem from ignorance rather than hatred. But then we have these questions of how do you marry into that? How can you deal with that? What can be done? But the major issue in this novel comes from the shared last names. It turns out that Andy's family owned slaves in the past and that the slaves often take their names from their owners. And it starts to look like Andy's family used to own Layla's family. And even though it's several hundred years later, it's just a little bit messed up that they're getting married. Intellectually, it's all in the past and all that, but it really doesn't pass the ick test, does it? And when you think about it, A lot of black people are going to have slavery in their past. And a lot of white people are going to have slave owners in their past. 200 years does produce a lot of great-great-grandparents. So lots of interracial relationships have this kind of history related to their people. And that kind of fits into what Sierra is saying. Layla is turning her back on her black ancestors. But Layla herself is mixed race. Her father is white. And even though she doesn't know who he is, maybe her own ancestors owned her own ancestors. For Andy's part, he makes some mistakes which he learned from, but he's mostly pretty good. He adores Layla. He's very caring. There's no red flags. It's not a toxic boyfriend novel. But Layla must figure out how her ancestors passed, how her identity fits into her marriage. And maybe it doesn't. Maybe she needs to leave Andy and date a black man. She must also figure out how to save her friendship with Sierra. And I think essentially adding peer pressure into this very complex racial issue really helps me appreciate some of the confusion and emotion Layla was going through. This is a very digestible, very readable novel. It is more on the commercial side of literary fiction, but it's still quite literary. It's tackling a pretty massive issue. And an issue that, in my reading experience, has very rarely been the central issue of a novel. I've never seen interracial relationships explored so deeply as in this novel. Now, caveat, while I recommend this, I am a white man who is married to a white woman, so it feels like I've got quite a lot to learn, especially around the emotions of that situation. And a person of colour or a mixed race person may already know that and find that quite intuitive. I do think that this is the sort of book that the colour of your skin will definitely impact your experience, but I did think it was wonderful. Great emotional writing and really well balanced between the exploration of themes themes, the character development, and the plot. It's the kind of novel where I think if you don't love it, and I think it's quite possible that you will love it, 
but that the novel will be the next step down, that you'll really enjoy this novel. It's really a love it or like it novel rather than a like it or hate it novel. Women and Daughters by Tony Birch. Birch is of mixed Irish, Afghan and Aboriginal bloodline and I feel like he's able to effortlessly pull the characters he places in his novel out of his identity, out of his family and friends and the people he knows and to just create a very rich tapestry of characters. But in this case, Birch is writing about the domestic abuse of women and he's not a woman but this is a real lesson in how to write about an issue when you're not part of the community it affects. I think it is worthwhile here just mentioning that men are the victims of domestic violence too and I'm not like trying to do a me too with stuff. I think we really need to sort of break down the shame attached to that for men to sort of come out and to seek help because that will ultimately help more victims. And nor is this me calling Tony Birch out. Domestic violence is a very large and complex issue and Birch hasn't tried to capture the depth and complexity of that. He's tried to capture what it means to the small group of characters in his novel. It's 1965 and our central character is Joe, a school-age student who is always in trouble and doesn't really know why. Joe lives with his mother, no father, and his older sister Ruby, who is so good at school, the nuns are the local Catholic primary school have decided to reward her with a trip to the country. Joe, on the other hand, is spending his days with Charlie, learning how to scrap metal and anything else his recently retired grandfather wants to teach him on the school holidays. Then Marion's younger sister Una appears on the doorstep, distressed and scared. It is pretty clear that she has been beaten and doesn't want to talk about it. Actually, she uses Joe as a shield to avoid a confrontation with her sister and explaining what happened. Una stays in Ruby's bed while she is away in the country in a bedroom that Ruby usually shares with Joe and Joe witnesses some bruising on his auntie that really underlines just how terrible this assault is. By setting this in 1965, Birch is changing some of the societal attitudes around domestic violence with nobody asking about what goes on behind closed doors. It almost seems like everybody is punching their wife, although in this whole novel there really is only one character that is beating one other character. It does create the feel in this novel that every man is beating his wife. Although Marion and Una do have one example of a man who has never hit his wife, Charlie, who loved Ada until the day that she passed and who is still grieving her. But Charlie tells the story of how he came very close to hitting Ada one day, of how he left the house for a number of hours to cool off and walk the street. And I really love this. It's so imperfectly perfect. Domestic violence happened because the assailant doesn't know how to regulate their emotion, doesn't know how to deal with their anger and rage. And here, Charlie is having those exact same issues. And which, honestly, they're the issues that need to be dealt with. But he hasn't dealt with them, and he finds a short-term solution. I love the complexity of this. I love the imperfect role model. I love that Charlie is not a saint, but he's doing everything right. I love that he's flawed, but working on it. I mean, not hitting your partner, or really not hitting anybody, isn't something you should get praised for. But there also needs to be the pragmatic side to this. There needs to exist men who have struggled to overcome this obstacle for other men to learn from. Or women or anybody being violent to their partner. I also love the inclusion of Joe, the next generation of man in this family, this young impressionable kid who is very much on the side of his auntie, but could also very easily grow up to be something else. We have this very caring, respectful, feminist family in which he is raised. What if he was raised in a different family? You're almost questioning, could this lovable, slightly ratbaggish young child grow up to be somebody who hits his wife? Is it nature or nurture? Una would have been the hardest character to get right. And her actions, I think, are very well explained. Her choices, her options, her fears. It's not as clear-cut as it sounds. And after all, in her own words, she's 
not anybody special. Doesn't that underlie somebody who has no self-worth and is a bit depressed? Doesn't that really get you into the mindset of somebody who might consider returning to an abuser? Birch is very good at demonstrating the pressures on men not to say anything to, how things can be all caught up in other aspects of life and how things might be in the self-interest of somebody to let things slide. And while this novel is very much set in the mid-1960s, it is still very relevant in today. In Australia, a woman is murdered by her intimate partner every 11 days, and a man every 91 days. And that's killed. You've got to hit somebody a lot of time just to kill them. Birch wraps this up with an absolutely heart-in-mouth thrilling plot. It is such a good ending, an ending that just makes you say, Wow, a novel that reminds you that women are nobody's punching bag. Don't forget to like this video. My next video will be my Booker Longlist Prediction. So make sure you're subscribed for that so you don't miss it, or at least so you can hold me accountable for getting distracted and making a different video. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.